What makes a style of music or a particular melody or song choice appropriate for use in prayer? There's no shortage of differing opinions on this question as it pertains to many religious communities around the world. Even within the same religion, the answer will continue to vary by religious denomination or sect, by individual synagogue, church, mosque, or temple, and even within the same community at different periods in that community's history. If you joined us for Rosh Hashanah this year, you know that it's certainly true for us at Beth Radim, which, by the way, if you haven't yet seen this year's Rosh Hashanah Adon Olam a cappella music videos, pause this video right now, head over to the Beth Radim YouTube channel and check them out. The rest of this video will make a lot more sense after you do. Let's begin. Shabbat Shalom, Shana Tova, and Gmar Chatima Tova to everyone out there. I certainly hope your Rosh Hashanah celebrations for 5782 were happy, sweet, and fulfilling. And if this is your first time checking out what the Beth Radim YouTube channel is all about, welcome. We hope you enjoy this little Dvar Torah, where we're about to pack in some Torah, Jewish philosophy, Jewish history, and popular Jewish culture all into about 10 minutes, so strap in. And if you like what we do, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And keep in mind that there's still time to give our office a call if you'd like to join us for virtual Yom Kippur services. This week's Parsha, Vayelech, always falls during the Yamim Noraim, or the Days of Awe. These are the 10 days between the holidays of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and the fast of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The Parsha takes us through the last day of Moses' life, which also happens to be Moses' 120th birthday. This is the source of the traditional Jewish birthday blessing, May you live to 120 years, Ad Mea Ve'esrim. After Moses formally passes his leadership role to Joshua, he composes a shira, which is a song or a poem for the Israelites to learn by heart. The song is about teshuva, which is the Jewish concept of repentance, literally meaning to return to God. Knowing how irreverent the Israelites can be at times, Moses believes that making them study and learn this song about teshuva will one day be helpful in guiding the Israelite people back to a life of righteousness. Even to this day, every educator knows that if you want to commit something important to memory, turn it into a song or a rhyme. Personally, I still can't remember which of the months have 30 days and which have 31 until reciting 30 days hath September, April, June, and November. And so it was in ancient Israel that music and poetry were an essential part of Israelite religious culture, teaching theological principles, and of course, bringing beauty to the act of worship in the temple. But throughout recorded history, it's clear that not all musical forms were deemed appropriate for worship. For as long as Jewish prayer music has existed, so has secular music, which included tavern drinking songs, work songs, songs for dancing, songs of love and seduction, which we might assume were kept far removed from the Levitical temple choir. But then again, perhaps not. The Book of Psalms contains, a hun contains 150 sacred poems, most of which begin with some kind of superscript, an introductory note with special instructions. For example, the superscript for Psalm 8 reads, Lamanatseach bin Ginot al, al Hashminit Mizmor le David, meaning, to the director for playing upon the eight stringed harp, a song of David. Or the superscript for Psalm 84, which reads, Lamanatseh al Hagigit Livne Korach Mizmor, meaning to the director for playing on the Gigit, a song for the children of Korach. The Gigit being some mysterious, untranslatable name for a musical instrument that has been lost to time. But a few of the Psalms have superscripts that seem particularly curious. Psalm 22 begins with the superscript, Lamanatseach al Ayelet Hashachar Mizmor le David, meaning, to the director, according to the deer of the dawn, 
a Song of David. The phrase, Deer of the Dawn, seems a strange phrase as an introduction to the director, as are the superscripts for Psalm 45 and 69, which both read, Lamanatseach al Shoshanim, a message to the director suggesting the psalm should be performed according to lilies. Scholars agree that lilies and deer of the dawn were likely names of popular secular songs at the time, indicating that the psalm should be sung to the melody of the popular tune, which means singing sacred texts to popular secular melodies has been a Jewish custom for at least two and a half thousand years. Of course, if we import secular music into our prayers, it should be done with care. As we just discussed, songs are mnemonic devices, and when we bring a secular song into, into our modern prayer service, it comes along with whatever it may have been associated with previously, including the song's original lyrics, its themes, and even the reputation of the composer. So, of course, there are songs to avoid bringing into shul with us. Not that we can't otherwise enjoy them, but only because singing them in shul would take away from our prayer service more than they would add. And that's really what it all boils down to. Does singing a religious text to the melody of a particular secular song bring beauty, meaning, and dare I even say fun to prayer? You be the judge. Shabbat Shalom. Have a happy, healthy, and sweet new year. Thank you.